Welcome to Fantasy Audiobook, Hogwarts, Start Fusion Phoenix Bloodline. Chapter 21. Please give me a plate of muffins, a steak, and two glasses of milk, thank you. Peter simply picked a few and said politely. The elf named Kiki was instantly excited, Mr. Wizard asked me to invite me. He actually said thank you. Oh, Kiki must make the best supper for this Mr. Wizard. Looking at the neurotic elf, Peter was afraid of trouble, waved his hand quickly, and said, please don't be too troublesome, just make a portion, and I'm already very hungry. Oh, Mr. Kiki's evil wizard is starving, and Kiki must punish himself. The house elf Kiki screamed, snapped his fingers, and quickly started Peter's supper, occasionally hitting his head with his head. Stone pillars under the kitchen counter. Peter York doesn't understand the weird idea of house elves, who have been enslaved for thousands of years, and he will punish himself with self-mutilation at every turn, and he can use magic to make delicious food at the same time. It seems that Peter wants to learn the magic of elf, it is pure wandless magic, it is hard to imagine how such a powerful elf was conquered by wizards. In the blink of an eye, delicious food appeared in front of him, and Peter could only sigh at the wonder of magic. Pushing one of the glasses of milk in front of Cedric, he quickly cut his steak and muffins with a knife. Peter pointed to the milk and said with a smile, drink more milk, you will grow taller in the future. The kitchen lights were dimly lit, and the orange-yellow candles on the table shone on Peter's jade-like face. In Peter's bright smile, Cedric drank the milk he usually hates the most. Peter is very satisfied with his appearance. People are visual animals. A good-looking appearance is very convenient in interpersonal communication, and he will have a good first impression. So he let go of himself tonight, tried to radiate like a peacock, and it was obvious that everyone was fascinated. He wondered if Voldemort was also relying on his handsome face to attract many people to join his Death Eater camp in the early stage. After the narcissism, Peter and Cedric left the kitchen with the farewell of the elf Kiki, and after casting a quick shrink magic on a pile of snacks that Cedric was holding, Peter and Cedric parted ways went back to the cellar along the same path, it was almost curfew time, and he didn't want to be caught again. The curfew time stipulated by the school is 10 o'clock in the evening, but the hyperactive students generally do not go to bed at this time, so after Peter came back, many students still stayed in the common room, either chatting or playing wizard chess. There were also several senior couples who were unscrupulously in love, making Peter, a single dog who had just eaten enough, almost vomited. Everyone in the common room showed kindness to Peter, and everyone who saw him would nod their heads and then be pulled by Alan to sit on the sofa in front of the fireplace, comfortably burning the fire. He felt that it was the first time he came to Slytherin, a good choice. In the days that followed, Peter York wandered between the classrooms, dormitories, and halls. Professor Sprout's herbal medicine, Professor Sinistra's astronomy, and Mrs. Hodge's flying lessons all passed smoothly. He performed well in these three classes, and was awarded three points by the system, and the points accumulated to 38 points. The basic course taught by the professor was very simple for him, so he borrowed the complete book of spells from the library. He could quickly master the spells that the lower grades needed to learn, but some of the spells in the latter part could only be mastered by the upper grades, so he just memorized the spell first and then find time to practice it. As for the place to practice, he had already chosen, which was Lupin's hiding place when he turned into a werewolf before, in the dark room under the beating willow tree, which could lead to the haunted house in Hogsmeade, and no one would go there. The best option, of course, was the on-demand room on the eighth floor, but it was close to the headmaster's office and could be spotted by Dumbledore at any time. Since he was a student of Slytherin, he didn't want to have eyes on him all the time if he showed extraordinary talent. If he wanted to get under the beating willow tree without being discovered, the first thing Peter had to learn was the phantom body spell, which was a spell only for oral level wizards. The disillusionment charm is indeed an advanced spell, and it took Peter York a week to successfully hide an apple with the disillusionment charm. Ding, congratulations to the host for mastering the new spell, reward two points. The current points are 40 points. The system rang. When Peter heard it, he was a little surprised. For the spells he had mastered before, the system only awarded one point. Unexpectedly, the phantom body spell can actually reward two points. It seems that the difficulty level of the spell is also within the reference range of the system points. 
Gradually, the things he could hide became bigger and bigger, and finally he tried to hide field, and it worked. Looking at the invisible field, Peter suddenly realized, and patted his forehead angrily. After nearly a month of practicing the illusory body charm, I finally remembered that I have a phoenix that can ignore the ban and teleport at any time. And he can also become a phoenix. If he learns teleportation from field, he may not need to practice shapeshifting in the future, and he can teleport to any place directly by turning into a phoenix. Field, can you take me under the old willow tree by the black lake? Peter York asked curiously. Field nodded, grabbed Peter, a red flame ignited on his body, and with a flash, teleported him to the side of the beating willow. According to Harry Potter's memory when he was in the third grade, Peter York successfully found the tree scar, and hit the scar on the old willow tree with a stone, and immediately got into the small hole under the root while the willow tree did not move. Following a narrow path, Peter York came to a dilapidated wooden house. It didn't look like it had been here in a long time, and there were scratches on the old wooden boards, probably from when Lupin turned into a werewolf. Looking around, next time he can ask Field to bring him here directly instead of going through the punching willow. Clean up, Peter frowned, brushing away the thick stains and dust. After it was finally cleaned up, looking at the old sofa and the broken chair, Peter thought of the transfiguration spell that Professor McGonagall had taught before. Although the class only allowed matches to be turned into needles, the same spell can be used to cast the same spell. It's just that the objects you want to deform are different. Reaching out his wand, Peter York tried his best to imagine a new armchair against the broken chair, chanting a spell, apparently too confident in himself. It's no wonder that transfiguration is specifically distinguished from charms, and is called by Professor McGonagall the hardest and most dangerous of all. It took him an afternoon to reluctantly turn the broken chair into an armchair that he could sit on, which had already taken most of his magic. Students of the same grade don't have so much magic power to use. Phoenix's blood endows him with majestic magic power, but it is not easy to control it. During this time, Peter also looked up books about phoenixes, but because of the rarity of phoenixes, most of them were specious. They either praised its power and beauty, said how powerful it was comparable to that of giant dragons, or told it like a mythical story. Most of the legends about the phoenix are of little reference value. Alan White, the twins, and Cedric, the few phoenixes who had met Peter, were eager to help after hearing that he was looking up books on phoenix. In the end, it was Cedric who provided a copy, which came from the book, Where Are the Fantastic Beasts, by Newt Scamander, a master of magical zoology, to have a more accurate understanding of the phoenix. Newt's commander described his understanding of the phoenix in more detail in his book. It was Dumbledore who graciously lent him his phoenix, Fox, to observe for a while before finally including this powerful and gorgeous magical beast in his book. The book introduces that the phoenix has a mortal vitality, it will spontaneously ignite when it is old, it will go through the process of death, and then reborn from the ashes, and it will continue to form a cycle. Moreover, it can carry things that are countless times heavier than itself, and can fight against magical creatures with a dangerous level of XXXXX, such as the giant dragon basilisk. Even ignoring the prohibition of apparition, you can teleport anywhere at any time. Only in view of the fact that the phoenix does not easily attack people and can be tamed, it was rated as 4X by the Ministry of Magic, that is, a rating standard that is dangerous and requires specialized knowledge and skilled wizards to deal with. Upon receiving this news, Peter had indescribably mixed emotions in his heart. Since its birth, the phoenix has experienced the process of growth, but it seems to be favored by God and endowed with the ability of immortality. It goes through the process from birth to aging in a continuous cycle like reincarnation. Have a young and strong body. Wizards in the magical world have been arguing for thousands of years about the topic of the phoenix or the egg. This clarifies that the phoenix race has an enviable immortality ability, and even the most feared death curse of the wizards is not a big threat to them. Unless the phoenix chooses to give up immortality, no one can kill anyone, it. The topic of immortality, whether in the east or the west, is the most coveted ability of human beings. Peter now doesn't know if he inherited the phoenix's ability to immortalize when he was a humanoid. After all, it is impossible for him to find someone to come to Arvada to give him a try. His form is between a phoenix and a human, and he can transform at any time, much like the transfiguration animagus. 
But everyone in the wizarding world knows that the wizard's animagus is a non-magical creature. Those who have tried the transformation of magical creatures in the past have undergone irreversible changes, becoming half-human, half-beast or irrational monsters. For examples like Peter, the only thing that is similar is the bloodline atavism that Ollivander said, that is, the wizard stimulated the ability of ancient magical creatures hidden in the bloodline, so that atavism happened. For example, the Parseltongue of the Slytherin family inherited the bloodline of the ancient magic snake, so that it can command snakes, but this kind of bloodline will basically not change its appearance. To say that the only example of the successful transformation of magical creatures at present is Voldemort, who has made the entire magical world extremely fearful. He has changed from a handsome and handsome man to a bald snake face. And in just a few decades, it has the huge magic power of Dumbledore for hundreds of years. The only possibility is that in the process of constantly creating horcruxes and splitting the soul, the bloodline of the magical creatures inherited from him is stimulated, and the phenomenon of bloodline attribution occurs. After all, the magic of wizards grows with age, and there is no other way. The source of the birth of wizards has not been verified, but it is said that ancient human beings combined with humanoid magical creatures to give birth to offspring with magical power, which is the earliest source of wizards. While many wizards scoff at this, Peter also finds it more credible. Because strictly speaking, he now belongs to the category of humanoid magical creatures. His original human body was burnt to ashes when he was brought to Nirvana for the first time by Field. Now he is reborn from the ashes and reshaped into a new body by the fire of Nirvana. And the wonderful combination of human soul and phoenix blood, coupled with the role of the super gene fusion device, shaped his existence as both a human and a magical creature. The fastest growth in magic power of wizards is from the age of 11 or 12 to adulthood. Peter's magic power is now comparable to that of an adult wizard. But his magic power is in a stage of rapid growth. Every day Peter can clearly feel that the magic power in his body is growing little by little. That's why he needs to practice magic in a dark room called a haunted house through the secret passage under the willow, and vent the magic power of the expansion in his body. Peter will go back to the dormitory whenever he has time, and then let Field take him to the dark room under the willow. Become what you want to change. At the same time, with the complete collection of magic spells found in the library, he has successfully cast more than a dozen magic spells, and the system points have also accumulated to 60 points. One step closer to 100 points. And he also found that the room he was staying in was in Hogsmeade, not under the willows he thought. Nearby residents are staying away from the haunted house, known as the Screaming Shack, because of the terrifying sounds that used to be heard on full moon nights. After practicing magic, Peter sat on the brown leather sofa that he had made, listening to the lively sounds from Hogsmeade Village in the distance, stood up curiously, pushed open the dilapidated door, and walked out. Hogsmeade Village is a village near the Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry. It is also the only magical village in the UK that does not live in muggles. It is recorded in the Hogwarts Libraries, Magic Historical Relics, and it is also a goblin in 1612. The Headquarters of the Mutiny Peter walked on the street, with shops lined up on both sides, passing a series of quirky shops such as the most representative Three Broomsticks Bar, Zoke Joke Shop, Honey Duke Candy Shop, Peter observed novelly. These are like fairy tale sites. Passing by a room that was about to peel off the paint on the hog's head bar, Peter quickened his pace. There lives another Dumbledore. Does the ghost know if this Dumbledore finds him, will he report to another Dumbledore who lives in Hogwarts? To know what he looks like now, he doesn't look like he is in the third grade, and today is not a day off, and students above the third grade will not come. Ding, sign into Hogsmeade Town, reward one point. The current point is 61 points. The system prompt sounded again. After walking around the street, Peter walked back and came to the Honey Duke candy store. He wanted to bring some snacks back for his friends to eat. Jingle bell. The sound of the bell rang with the opening of the door. Welcome to the Honey Duke candy store, what do you need? Ambrose Frome, the slender, bald owner, asked without looking up, who was sorting the goods on the shelf. I'll take a look first, sir. Peter didn't bother the busy shopkeeper, looking around, thinking about choosing what to buy. The owner, Ambrose Frome, heard the young voice of the customer, stopped and looked up at Peter. 
Looking at Peter's Slytherin school uniform and his 11 or 12 year old appearance, he smiled unexpectedly and clearly. It seems that you have found a secret passage, which is really good, is it a first year or a second year? Hogwarts's students are getting smarter. Then he comforted. Don't worry, I will keep it a secret for you. In the past, some students have found the secret passage to Hogsmeade Village, but they are not as young as you. Peter has plenty of funds. After the owner's enthusiastic recommendation, he bought ordinary magical snacks such as BB Dewey beans, chocolate balls, ZZ honey candy, and toffee. Then I bought Bubble Super Bubble Gum, which can blow big bubbles, Ice Mouse, which can freeze its tongue, Pepper Urchin, who can breathe fire, and a dense pile of cockroaches, ready to give to twins who like to be funny. In view of Peter's consumption of a lot of gold galleons in the store, the store owner kindly wrapped the candy with a chapter of large oil paper, and used magic to reduce the package to the size of a fist and put it into his pocket. The owner of the shop, Mr. Frome, who already knew Peter's name, patted his bald head with a smile, and said to Peter with a mysterious face, Mr. York, do you want to know the other one, which can be connected here in Hogwarts? Secret Passage. And it is a very secret passage, few people know about it. Peter looked suspicious, not knowing what medicine the shopkeeper was selling in the gourd. Looking at Peter's puzzled expression, Ambrose Frome gave the answer directly. There is a secret passage in my shop that leads directly to the third floor of Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry, and some students come through this secret passage. It's very convenient to come here to buy things, you don't have to wait until the weekend to come, you can come at any time, and you don't have to worry about being caught by the professor. How is it, are you interested? Mr. Farum, why are you telling me this, shouldn't the less people know about it, the better? Peter asked puzzled. Aren't you old enough to come to Hogsmeade Village? Through this secret passage, you can buy any candy that you want to buy directly from my shop, without worrying about running into the professor. Owner Ambrosoff Rum winked at Peter. Ah, Peter suddenly realized that the owner of this candy shop is indeed a businessman. After seeing Peter's spending power, he knew that he was a student of Slytherin, so he wanted to expand his business to him. After all, most of the Slytherin students have a good family background, and the secret road is a very good sales route, which can make the restless students in the first and second grades feel exciting and buy things that cannot be bought in the school. Since the owner of Honey Dupe generously gave a secret message, Peter followed the owner's guidance to the cellar. There was a grey trapdoor under the cellar, which seemed to be integrated with the floor and was difficult to find. Open the trapdoor, and there is a long and narrow step under the door. Go down, and after a short and narrow dirt passage, there is a slide in front of you. The slide is not too steep, you can climb it, and at the end of the slide is the exit. Peter tapped the back of the statue blocking the exit with his wand and said, separate left and right. The exit opened, Peter walked out, and watched the huge hump-backed one-eyed witch statue covered the exit again, leaving no trace. The statue of the one-eyed witch with a hunchback is on the third floor of the castle. Peter's lunatic attributes broke out again, and he seemed to be spinning around for a long time. Fortunately, it was still daytime, and there was no class in the afternoon, so he had enough time to find the right way. The stairs on the third floor were a nightmare, they kept moving, Peter went down the moving stairs, but at the end there was either a false door that couldn't be opened. Either an abandoned classroom was opened, or a dark corridor room that seemed to contain terrifying monsters that would rush out at any time. Peter scratched his head violently, and he would go crazy if he couldn't get out of the third floor. His usual self-cultivation collapsed in front of this labyrinth-like castle. He never found out that he had the attributes of a lunatic in his last life. How could he have so many problems in his entire life? After finally returning to the moving stairs, Peter didn't want to go any further, he just sat on the stairs, and moved with the stairs. Gryffindor lived on the eighth floor, Ravenclaw lived on the top of the tower, both of them. To pass here, he is not afraid that he will not meet anyone. Peter looked at the mechanical watch on his wrist, it was already 5 o'clock in the afternoon, and all the grades with classes should be out of class. The hour hand is moving a little bit, and Peter's patience is also disappearing a little bit. He swears to get the marauder's map left by the robbery group as soon as possible, otherwise the lukai that breaks out from time to time will kill him. There was a sound of footsteps coming from upstairs, and Peter stood up and looked up to see a group of students coming down from above 
students from Ravenclaw and Hufflepuff, who appeared to have just finished their class. The students in the two colleges also noticed Peter and looked at this Slytherin student curiously. Peter smiled and waited quietly for these students to go down, intending to follow them. As for asking for directions, he would not do such an idiotic thing. The girls were fascinated by the smile on this handsome face, blushing and shoving each other, and did not take the initiative to ask. Hey, girls in Europe and America are so precocious, Peter York sighed. Peter, it's you, why are you here? Cedric emerged from behind the crowd, put on Peter's shoulder, and asked excitedly, not seeing him much for a while. It was rare to meet a familiar person, the smile on Peter's face became real, he turned and half leaned on Cedric's body, and confided in his ear aggrieved, I got lost, and I didn't go around the third floor for a long time. Yes, and the stairs are constantly changing, and you can't go down to the second floor. The girls who had been paying attention to Peter, seeing this scene, let out a suppressed exclamation, as if a strange attribute had been aroused in an instant, and their eyes were shining between Peter and Cedric. Cedric was a little stiff from Peter's actions, but he was dumbfounded when he heard Peter's aggrieved voice. Lost again, so you've been waiting here. Peter followed Cedric down and said angrily, I didn't realize that I was a lunatic before, how come I've been lost twice since I came to Hogwarts, and who was this staircase in the first place? It's designed, is it interesting to change it back and forth? Fortunately Slytherin is in the basement, and I don't have to take the moving stairs. It's hard to imagine if I were sorted into Gryffindor or Ravenclaw, it would be an absolute disaster. Peter said happily. I think you should learn a spell that can guide you, or choose to walk with others, so you don't have to worry about getting lost. Cedric carefully analyzed Peter's situation and suggested. Is there such a spell? I'm still looking for a map of Hogwarts. Peter asked suspiciously. He didn't see such a spell in the Book of Spells. I remember a spell that guides the way. It's called the orientation spell, but few people use it, so it doesn't belong to the scope of basic spells. I only remember it after watching my dad cast it once. You can ask Professor Flitwick, he is a master of spells, and there are almost no spells he doesn't know about. Okay, there's a charms class tomorrow, I'll ask Professor Flitwick. Peter nodded. The two exchanged whispers while walking with the large army. The girls of Hufflepuff and Ravenclaw, looking at the two handsome boys in front of them, leaned together and whispered excitedly, exuding a pink atmosphere. Cedric didn't know that there was a peculiar race called rotten women in this world, but he could only feel a few pairs of hot eyes staring at him, making him uncomfortable. What's wrong, Sid? Peter asked, noticing Cedric's awkward look. It's okay. Cedric shook his head, trying his best to ignore the feeling in his back. After arriving in the hall smoothly, Peter was about to separate from Cedric when he returned to Slytherin's long table. He remembered the shrunken candy in his bag, and followed Cedric to sit at the end of the Hufflepuff long table. With a puzzled look on Cedric's face, he took out the parchment paper wrapped in honeydew candy from his bag and put it on the table with his wand. Quick zoom. The package turned into a big bag, the oil paper was unwound, and the sweetness of the candy came out from the inside. Cedric looked at the various candies in the package in surprise, which included almost all kinds of candies in the magical world, and swallowed unconsciously. Peter, did you evacuate Honeyduke? How is that possible? Peter shook his head, with a joking expression on his face, and said, I just asked Mr. Ambrose Frome to get a few copies of each candy in his shop. Cedric and Hufflepuff students next to him looked at Peter's unconcerned expression, silently talking about the rich man. Among them, students from better families have a maximum of one or two gold galleons for a month's pocket money, and it is converted according to the currency of the magic world. One gold galleon equals 17 silver cents, one silver cents equals 26 copper special, they spend most of the time buying a few packs of candy for a silver cookie. Looking at this large bag of candies, it roughly looks like 20 or 30 gold galleons. You must know that the price of a wand is only 7 gold galleons. Peter likes sweetness, so he took out a bag of ZZ honey candy, opened it, took out a golden candy and put it in his mouth, squinted his eyes with satisfaction, and then took out another and stuffed it into Cedric's mouth Lee, asked, how is it, not bad? Immediately, he looked at the crowd, pointed at the pile of candies in front of him, and said, I bought these for you. You can choose what you want to eat. Don't be polite to me. 
Cedric only picked up a packet of ZZ Honey candy, but he refused to take more. Peter shoved him a bunch of candies and told him to share it with other students before slipping away. Go to the Gryffindor long table and distribute some normal candy and the pile of weird candy bought just for him to the Weasley twins who are playing with their classmates. The two brothers accepted it with great joy, especially when they saw the mischievous candy products such as Ice Mouse, Pepper Boy, and Cockroach Pile, they were even more moved and felt that Peter knew them very well. Oh, Peter, you're such a buddy, what would we do without you? Possessed by the twins, they hugged Peter excitedly, wiped their non-existent tears with their hands, and sang in Shakespeare's tone. Peter rolled his eyes speechlessly, broke free from the twins' body, took the remaining pile of candy back to Slytherin's long table, and sat in his seat. He hadn't finished eating the ZZ Honey candy he opened just now, but he felt that this candy suits his taste very well, so after leaving all the honey candies, he distributed the other candies to the students at the adjacent table. Alan White unceremoniously took half of the candy, in his words, as a roommate's welfare. Peter said he didn't want to deal with the increasingly cheeky roommate. Honey Duke's candies are not cheap, and Slytherin students don't often get them, so he gladly accepted Peter's candies, and there was a sense of closeness in his demeanor. It wasn't dinner time yet, and there were only a few servings of fruit and desserts on the table. Most students do their homework at their desks, and classes at Hogwarts are easy, with no more than three or four classes a day. But the professors assign a lot of homework. For example, after Professor McGonagall's transfiguration class, they have to hand in an assignment that fills a whole sheet of parchment. Some lazy students try to write as large as possible, preferably filling parchment. Peter's homework is very little, and his magic progress far exceeds that of the students in the same grade. He is the first to successfully perform the magic taught by the professor in each class, and he strives to be perfect. So even the most strict Professor McGonagall smiled and exempted him from his homework, so that he could come to her office to ask questions at any time if he didn't understand. This made Peter's position in the first grade of Slytherin more and more consolidated, and no one spoke of his bloodline, and some even speculated that Peter's ancestors might be wizards. But there are always a few extreme pure-blood advocates who don't like Peter, especially after seeing his popularity among the Slytherin senior girls, and decide to teach him a lesson. Derek, who was in the fifth grade, took a bite of the pork chop and said to his companions, This mudblood not only defiled our Slytherin, but also deceived a lot of people with his face, making the first-year freshmen get close to this mudblood. I don't know how Chris Jones is a prefect. To take the lead in accepting this mudblood is really depraved. His classmate Thomas asked, Then what are you going to do, are you going to teach this mudblood a good lesson? Derek nodded fiercely, I've been paying attention to this mudblood for a while, and he almost always runs between the library, the dormitory and the classroom. I'll give him a good one tonight while he's on his way from the library back to the dormitory. Lesson, keep him away from the purebloods of our academy. Better get him out of the Slytherin lounge before the filthy mudblood smell gets in the way. Thomas asked nervously, but I heard that the mudblood has mastered a lot of spells now, and when the school chief battle started, he even used armor to protect himself. We haven't mastered this spell yet. Are you sure? Can you beat him? He's a mudblood in grades, and he has a great armor and protection. Can't I still deal with him as a fifth grade student? Derek was a little angry when he heard this, and then said with a sinister smile, I just happened to be at home from home. Learned a curse ready to use it on this mudblood tonight. Let's see how it works. Seeing Derek's smile, Thomas couldn't help having a cold war, but he knew that Derek's father was still locked up in Azkaban because he followed the mysterious man. And the person Derek admires most is his father. Thomas said hesitantly, Derek, don't you want to cast black magic on that mudblood? If you are found, you will be fired. Derek looked at his roommate who had been playing with him better, glared at him and asked, Thomas, what the hell is going on with you today? How dare you become so timid? It's just dealing with a mudblood, just be careful and you'll be fine. Besides, it's not to kill him, it's just to make him suffer for one night, and the next day nothing happens. Even if he wants to find a professor, he can't find the problem. Thomas was eventually persuaded by Derek to ambush Peter York in the hallway tonight. Peter didn't know that someone was going to hurt him at this time, and he was cautiously walking down the stairs to the Ravenclaw Tower. 
He was going to ask the charms professor for instructions on the orientation spell, and since he knew the function of this spell to guide the way, he ran to ask non-stop. The students of Ravenclaw do not live in the main building of the castle like the students of other colleges, but live alone in a sharp tower. They have to come down from the Ravenclaw Tower every day, and then go to the main building to have meals and classes. Peter, a student in a Slytherin school uniform, appeared in the Ravenclaw Tower, and immediately attracted the attention of the Ravenclaw students passing by on the corridor. Some freshmen knew Peter's name. Among them, the girl named Alice Wick took the initiative to ask, Mr. York, what's the matter with you coming to our college? Do you need my help? Peter was stunned for a moment when he saw the girl, then remembered her name and said with a smile, you can call me Peter. Alice, can I call you that? Alice Wick blushed a little and said, of course, Peter. Peter glanced at the blushing little girl, and could only sigh at the precociousness of English girls, and then explained, I want to find Professor Flitwick, and I want to ask him for a spell. I don't know if the professor is still in the office now, inside. Iris Wick came back to his senses and nodded, Professor Flitwick is in the office at the top of the tower, do you need me to take you there? Peter looked at Alice's expectant gaze, and then looked at the gossipy female companion behind her, shook his head and refused, thank you Alice, but no, I know how to go, you still go with your companion's bar. Then, in her disappointed eyes, she quickly climbed the stairs and walked to a higher place. It wasn't until he couldn't see the eyes behind him that Peter breathed a sigh of relief, it wasn't his fault that he was handsome. Although he doesn't mind having a relationship, it's definitely not these teenage girls. He is a mature person in his heart, he doesn't like the perverts of little girls, and he doesn't want to play development games. Climbing up several flights of stairs, Peter finally reached the top of the Ravenclaw Tower, with the obvious dormitory door on the left, with a bronze knocker affixed to the wooden door. The method of entering the Ravenclaw common room is different from answering the secret words for Slytherin and Gryffindor, but the bronze door knocker asks the question, and the answer is correct to enter the lounge. And other college students, if they answer correctly, can also enter the Ravenclaw common room. But Peter didn't want to enter the Ravenclaw lounge at this time, he turned right to a wooden door next to him, and knocked lightly on the knocker. Come in, a high-pitched voice came from the wooden door. Peter pushed the door open and greeted the professor, Professor Flitwick, good afternoon. Professor Flitwick sat on a special high chair, looked up to see Peter, and asked in surprise, Good afternoon, Mr. York. Do you have anything to do with me? Professor Flitwick was very impressed with Peter York. In every class of his, this student could cast a spell right away. Although he deliberately hid, he was still noticed by Flitwick, who had been teaching for many years. Peter looked at the diminutive professor behind his desk, and didn't have the slightest thought in his mind. This Ravenclaw Dean is not only proficient in spells, but also a dual competition champion. With the sensitivity endowed by the Phoenix bloodline, he could feel the majestic magic power in Professor Flitwick's short body. In addition to Dumbledore, he and Professor McGonagall are in the academy, and the magic is powerful. Even Professor Snape came close. Peter said shyly, Professor Flitwick, I know from my friends that there is a directional spell that can guide the way. Do you know this spell? I want to learn this spell, but I have searched the library collection, but I can't find it. Find this spell. Hearing this, Professor Flitwick nodded, direction spell. I know, this is a somewhat remote spell, so it is generally not recorded in standard spells. Then he said with some disapproval, Mr. York, this directional spell, some it's complicated and requires a higher grade to get access to. I think you'd better learn the standard spells from the book first, you can't be too ambitious. Peter said anxiously, Professor, I have already learned all the spells in the first grade textbook, and now I am learning the content of the senior grades by myself. And I am learning this spell because I have the habit of getting lost, if I don't learn the directional spell well, I might be trapped in a classroom in the castle someday. So teach me the spell, Professor. Professor Flitwick said in disbelief, you said you have finished the first grade. Peter looked at the professor in disbelief, took out his wand, and pointed at a book on the table. Then the book slowly floated up, and flew around at will with the direction of the wand. Silent casting, Professor Flitwick exclaimed in surprise. Although he has seen many talented people, he has never seen anyone who can cast silent spells in the first grade. This is amazing. 
Then Peter showed the fire-making spells, softening spells, cutting spells, unlocking spells, and repairing spells that he needed to learn in the first grade. Finally got the floating book back on the table and danced a graceful waltz. Flitwick watched Peter skillfully cast all the spells, his mouth wide open, then he clapped his hands excitedly, and said in admiration, Well done, Mr. York. You are one of the students I have taught so far, the most talented the tallest one. I think since you can cast a silent spell, then this senior's directional spell is no problem for you. Peter said a little embarrassedly. Professor, you are very praised, these spells are the simplest and most basic, so it is not difficult to cast. Otherwise, it took me half a day to put an apple in visibility, it only took a month to completely cover myself. It's still too difficult. Professor Flitwick, who originally wanted to admire, was choked by his words. The illusory body spell is an advanced spell that even many Oros can't master well. Even he learned this spell from fifth grade, and finally mastered this spell in seventh grade. As a result, Peter said that it took him a month to fully master it. This is too Versailles. Professor Flitwick thought that the freshman was arrogant, and wanted to say a few words to blow his arrogance, but when he saw Peter's expression that he thought his learning ability was poor, he swallowed the words. He waved his wand, and a black notebook on the shelf flew down and landed on the table. Flitwick touched the notebook with some nostalgia, and then handed it to Peter, this is the magic spell class note I wrote down when I was still in school. There is a record of directional spells on it, I hope it will be useful to you. When he heard that it was Professor Flitwick's notebook, Peter was very excited. Professor Snape's textbook on the Half-Blood Prince made Harry Potter, an average student at the potion level, directly a proud disciple of Professor Slughorn. I also learned Snape's original God's Edge and Shadowless spell from the above. I don't know how much content there will be in Professor Flitwick's spell notes. Professor Flitwick looked at Peter's excited look and reminded seriously. Mr. York, I didn't want to give you this notebook, there are some spells on it that are not suitable for your age. But I think you are very talented, if you let it go it's a pity for you to keep doing nothing. So you have to promise me that when you are alone, you can't cast the above spells at will. If some of the above spells are used incorrectly, they will cause huge accidents. Peter was happy to note the result, and kept nodding his head to assure. Professor Flitwick smiled and sat back to his original position, then said, of course, if you encounter something you don't understand, you can always come to me and ask, I'm very welcome here. Finally, I want to invite you to join my spell club. The Charms Club. Is there such a club in the school? Peter was a little surprised, he had never heard of the name. Professor Flitwick said with a smile, this is a study group I set up. Most of the members are Ravenclaw students. If you come, it is the second Slytherin Academy. The location is in the Ravenclaw Common Room, where there are it belongs to the library of our college, and we usually discuss the knowledge of magic spells there. The second Slytherin, the professor, who is the first? Peter asked curiously. It's Chris Jones, the prefect of your academy. He is very talented in magic spells. I was invited to join the club in the third year. You should have a common topic in the future. Flitwick replied. Of course, Peter was very willing to be able to join such a group, and he happily agreed to the professor's invitation. Ding, get an invitation from the professor to join the magic club, and reward one point. The current points are 62 points. The system quietly awarded a point, but Peter, who had turned off the system prompt sound, did not hear the prompt sound. The previous system's sudden prompt always caught him off guard, so he only asked the system to remind him when his points reached 100. After this period of contact with the magical world, Peter clearly felt that the entire magical world was still in the world of 16 or 17, and the main wealth was still in the hands of a few pure bloods. Even the important positions in the Ministry of Magic were pure bloods. The family is in control. This makes muggle-born Peter feel a little bad. Muggle-born students, the best place to go after graduation is to become Oro of the Ministry of Magic, equivalent to the police in the muggle world. But to become Oro, you need to pass at least five NEWT exams, and each of them must be at least E exceeding expectations. Hogwarts grades are divided into six grades, divided into O excellent E exceeded expectations A pass P fail D terrible T troll. 
and there are only six NEWT exams, and at least five of them need to be above E to enter the Oro department and become an Oro trainee, which is very difficult. Students at Hogwarts take OWL exams, proctored by the Ministry of Magic, in fifth year, NEWT exams in seventh year. These two exams are very important and are related to the future of the students. But although Hogwarts is a closed school, the curriculum is very relaxed, similar to Peter's previous university, no one will supervise it, it all depends on the consciousness of the students. So many students play for seven years, and when they graduate, they realize that their future is uncertain. Many students from muggles are used to life in the wizarding world and do not have muggle certificates. So in the end, the lucky ones became part-time employees in Diagon Alley. Those who are unlucky are penniless, and finally get caught in Azkaban because of theft or crime. After coming out again, he fell directly into Nocturne Alley, danced with the Dark Wizard, and lost his life one day. These things are the conclusions that Peter has come to by collecting various information these days. Even the most basic spells of wizards, in the Liskar bookstore, which is known as the richest in the UK, the spells above are standard spells, are some life magic. Some more powerful spells will not appear on the books in the bookstore. Just like the high-level spells such as the Disillusionment spell, Patronus spell, Occlumency, Dementor, which he is familiar with, except for the Hogwarts library, only pure blood wizards have such spell books. Muggle wizards were only exposed to these spells during their seven years at Hogwarts. But how could a group of teenage children, when they come to an uncontrolled school, calm down and go to the library to look up these materials? That's why many muggle wizards have nowhere to go as soon as they graduate. Didn't even master a few spells. But such a fact was not noticed, or was deliberately ignored. Many muggle students came to the magical magical world happily, but after getting used to the magical life, they didn't even have the chance to step into the real magic world, and they could only gradually degenerate. Peter didn't worry about his future. At the worst, he could return to the muggle world to be his earl, and his family's wealth could let him squander for a few lifetimes. And since he came to Hogwarts, Peter almost used the library as his base. Basically, everyone who knew Peter knew that if they wanted to find him, the most likely place was the library. The Hogwarts Library is arguably the most complete place for magic books in the UK. Thousands of years of magical knowledge have been accumulated here, arguably the most precious place in Hogwarts. It's just ignored by a lot of people. Even Voldemort, a wizard from an orphanage, in addition to his talent, the reason why he can quickly become strong is probably the library is the main reason. There are even Horcrux making books in the restricted area of the library, so you know there is a lot of books here. Peter even guessed that Voldemort wanted to apply for the position of black magic professor over and over again, part of the reason was to gain the massive magical knowledge here. He cursed the defense against the dark arts position only to be rejected by the wary Dumbledore. Leaving Professor Flitwick's office, Peter happily held the notebook and walked to the library. Coming to the library, Peter first greeted Mrs. Pants, the librarian, before finding a suitable seat to sit down. Then he opened Professor Flitwick's notebook. On the first page of the notebook, all petrification spells were recorded, and the spell-casting gestures and precautions were recorded in detail. Looking at this page, Peter was very happy, as expected of the notes of Professor Flitwick, the master of spells, Peter felt a little itchy at this time, and wanted to cast the spell according to the method on the note. But as soon as he saw Mrs. Pants with a stern face in the distance, he gave up this dangerous idea, unless he didn't want to come to the library in the future. Immediately afterwards, he flipped through the content behind him curiously, and the more he saw the smile on his face, the more he couldn't hide it. There is a spell recorded on almost every page behind this, some spells he has learned, but many more spells he has not touched. The basic spells such as confusing people, quick recovery, flying sand and stone, stopping spells, and duplicating them in pairs are all recorded in detail above. In the back, there is an upgraded version of the armor and body protection, super armor and body protection, all plus protection spells, dementors, guardian angels, and all curses are the final curse. This kind of advanced spell can be said to be a spell book compiled by Professor Flitwick himself. Peter sat in the library, fascinated by the spell knowledge in his notebook, without feeling the passage of time. Until Mrs. Pants came to him and knocked on the table, he woke Peter, who was caught in the study. 
Seeing Peter's bewildered expression, Mrs. Pants said in a rare soft tone, it's almost time for curfew. You should go. Peter reacted, quickly put away the notes, and said apologetically, sorry, Mrs. Pants, I read too seriously and didn't notice the time. I've caused you trouble. For children who love to learn, adults will reciprocate favorably. Mrs. Pins squeezed out a slight smile on her face that had not shown a smile for a long time, and praised, there are very few students who love learning like you, even Ravenclaw students are not as good as you. Well, you should go, otherwise the curfew will be imposed. I didn't go back to the dormitory before, but if I get caught, I will have points deducted. Peter nodded, packed his things, got up and thanked Mrs. Pants, and left the library. In the far corner, two sleepy big men were looking in the direction of the library and finally saw Peter walking out. Derek hurriedly woke up Thomas, who was about to fall asleep, wake up, that mudblood came out. Ah, it's finally out. Thomas woke up and looked at Peter who was walking down the hallway in the distance, this mudblood really loves to study, and after staying all night, he should go to the Ravenclaw group of nerds. Bar. The two quietly followed Peter, and Derek was eager to try, and said with a ferocious smile, this mudblood has made us wait for so long, we must teach him a lesson and make him suffer all night. Peter didn't notice the movement behind him at all, all his mind was thinking about the spell on the notebook. As he walked towards a dimly lit corridor, quickly imprisoned, suddenly sounded behind him. When Peter heard the sound, he instinctively used the super armor protection, the spell that just flashed in his mind. I saw a layer of white mask quickly appear around him, surrounding him, and flying out a spell shot at him. Peter turned to look at the attacker and found two senior Slytherin students, his face turned cold, and said, are you trying to attack me? Two seniors bullying a freshman. Don't you feel ashamed? Peter was surprised and happy at this time. To his surprise, he was almost attacked by these two people. The happy thing is that for the first time, he successfully displayed the super armor and body protection. The system in my mind has rewarded two more points. At this time, Peter, who was shrouded in super armor, was like a god, majestic and handsome. Looking at the two of them seriously. Derek looked even more jealous when he looked at him now. How could a stinky mudblood have such a perfect appearance? Derek, who thinks that black magic is invincible, said arrogantly, little mudblood, made a fancy spell and thought it scared me. Why don't you stay in your stinky muggle world and come to us? Slytherin, Sully Slytherin, I'm going to teach you a good lesson. Either you obediently get me back into the muggle world, or tighten your tail and don't appear in our eyes. Peter was going to laugh when he heard it. It was the first time he realized the paranoid views of these pure blood wizards on blood. He looked at the two and said with a smile, I don't know if we in the muggle world stink, but we are generally only for pets like cats, dogs, and so on, we talk about bloodlines. I don't know what bloodlines you are, tell me. Neither of them were stupid, and when Peter compared their proud lineage to cats and dogs, he was immediately annoyed. Derek took his stout wand and pointed it at Peter, gritted his teeth and said, you mudblood, how dare you insult our pure blood. I want you to experience the harshest punishment. I've heard of gouging out the heart. A bone spell. My dad improved it, and it's not as painful as the original spell, but it's enough for you to drink. And there won't be any traces after it, even if Dumbledore checked it himself. Gouging out the bone. Derek's wand shot a beam towards Peter. Super armor and body protection. All protection. Armor and body protection. Peter had heard the name of gouging the heart, and he cast a spell again and again. The Longbottom and his wife were tortured mad by Lestrange's use of this spell, so he was very careful at this time, preparing to avoid this spell as soon as possible. It's just that Derek's gouging bone curse hit Peter's super strong armor and was thrown away, and even Peter's first layer of protection was not broken. Peter looked at the result speechlessly, and said to the two who had not yet accepted the result, are you sure this is the real heart-piercing curse? It doesn't fit the reputation of the three unforgivable curses at all. You're bluffing me, right? It's impossible. This is obviously the black magic I learned from my dad's notebook. How can I not break even a protective spell? Derek dared not accept the fact, and continued to cast a spell on Peter, but except for the first a layer of protective spell swayed outside the ripples, and they were all bounced out. Thomas on the side looked at Derek, who was a little crazy, and Peter, who was watching the play in the protective circle. 
he had a bad premonition and quickly pulled Radric and said, let's go, this guy is using super armor. That's a protective spell that my dad doesn't even know, we can't beat him. Peter looked at the two who were about to withdraw, and immediately quit, why was he the one who was passively beaten? He directly raised his wand and said to the two of them, all petrified. The two people who were about to retreat in the distance were immediately stopped and fell straight to the ground. The force of the impact made Peter feel pain. He came to the two of them, looking at Derek, whose eyes were full of resentment, and Thomas, whose eyes were rolling and begging. With a smile, he said, sneak attack on me, and want to use black magic. If you can't beat it, you want to run away. How can there be such a good thing? I think about how to deal with the two of you. There, Peter's eyes lit up, I'll hang you upside down and hang them in the corridor, let's blow the cold wind all night. Oh, I'm so kind. You treat me like this, and I just treat you like this. You must remember my generosity in the future. Afterwards, the two petrified people were directly turned into long ropes by Peter using two wooden sticks, and hung upside down on the periphery of the corridor, swaying in the wind. Peter looked at his work with satisfaction and left happily. After Peter left the corridor, in the shadow of a corner, a tall figure and a short figure came out, it was Dumbledore and Professor Flitwick. Flitwick watched Peter disappear with satisfaction, and said to Dumbledore, I read him right, Peter York is a very talented student, and he is mentally bright, not like a Slytherin student at all, it would be great if he could be in Ravenclaw. Quote, I gave him all the spell notes I summarized, and I didn't even give it to the students of my own academy. It's just that his talent is really terrifying, and he has even displayed super armor and body protection. It won't take long for the notes to be given to him. Dumbledore looked at the place where Peter disappeared, and then looked at the two Slytherin students who were hanging in the air. After thinking deeply for a while, he was relieved and said to Professor Flitwick with a smile, Felius, you were right. Peter this kid is very talented, even higher than Voldemort. And his mind is not bad, he is really like a pure researcher. Although I don't know why the sorting hat assigned him to Slytherin, but obviously he can protect himself. As you may not know, this little guy is an earl in the muggle world. He's obviously very good at dealing with Slytherin students. We don't have to worry about his suffering at all. And he still has good friends in Gryffindor and Hufflepuff. We just need to guide him at a critical time, and we don't have to worry about him going astray. Maybe we will welcome a very good student at Hogwarts. After Professor Flitwick heard Dumbledore say Voldemort's name, his body trembled, and he said quickly, Dumbledore, please don't say that name again. Peter York, I will keep an eye on it, I have invited him to join my spell. Club, you can rest assured. Dumbledore looked at Flitwick's reaction and sighed helplessly, Phileas, fear of a name will deepen the fear of this name. Flitwick shook his head, Dumbledore, I'm not you, I don't have the power to fight the source of fear. After he cast a spell on this name, we're doomed to never call the mysterious man by his name. Dumbledore gave up. He turned to Flitwick and said, Phileus, guide Peter well, he's a good boy who knows how to thank you, and he'll be close to you when he gets your notebook. He may be the one we face in the future. It's time to turn the situation around. Flitwick nodded in surprise, not expecting Dumbledore to rate Peter so highly. Then he looked at the two people hanging in the corridor and asked, what should I do with these two people? Dumbledore looked at the two Slytherin students in the distance with deep eyes, and then said indifferently, let them continue to hang, although Derek's black magic was blocked by Peter's super armor, but if other ordinary if you are a student, you may be suffering. Since Peter has chosen his way of repaying, we don't have to intervene. Hearing this, Flitwick was also very angry and said, actually attacked the lower grades in the school corridor, and even performed black magic. If they are strictly investigated, they should be expelled from the school and sent to Azkaban to calm down. Good luck to them. Dumbledore, looking in the direction of Peter's disappearance, smiled and said, who knows, the little snakes may have different personalities, but one thing is that they hold grudges. I don't think this is the end, maybe I'll have to do it for Derry they are worried. Peter, this little guy, I don't think he looks like such a generous person. Just hanging up and taking revenge, it doesn't look like a Slytherin style. Chapter 31 Back in the dormitory, Alan White, who was lying in bed, saw Peter and asked curiously, why did you come back so late today? It's curfew time now. 
Peter smiled and didn't say anything about Derek's surprise attack on him, only that he was fascinated by reading books in the library. Alan White said with admiration, If I love learning like you, I don't have to worry about final exams. By the way, I saw that you didn't come to the hall for dinner, so I brought you some bread and ham and put them on your desk. Eat some if you're hungry. When Peter heard this, he said gratefully, Thank you, Alan. I'm hungry, thank you. At this time, Peter also noticed that he hadn't eaten in the afternoon, and his stomach was empty. He was dazed by the sneak attack just now, and he forgot to go to the back kitchen to find something to eat. After he devoured the food on the table, Peter lay down comfortably on the bed and fell into deep thought. In fact, Peter didn't intend to let the two people who attacked him so easily. But what the Phoenix bloodline gave him was not just majestic magic power, but also keen intuition. So he noticed that there was another person in the corner of the corridor. And from the time he and Derek and the others faced off, where was he hiding? The students in the school didn't have such flawless illusions, and the professors, if it was Snape or McGonagall, they wouldn't do nothing and just hide there. So Peter guessed, and finally figured that the most likely Dumbledore was in that corner. Just now, under his eyes, he used super armor to protect himself. In order to avoid being used by Dumbledore as a reserve for the Dark Lord, he could only give a small punishment, hang Derek and the two, and blow the cool breeze all night. As for whether he would just let the two who attacked him just like that, Peter felt that he was not so kind. Can easily let go of those who want to use black magic against themselves. He doesn't know how effective the black magic that Derek casts, but it is well known that the damage of black magic is irreversible. That's why the Ministry of Magic has banned the use of black magic. Don't look at how easy it is for Peter to block the attack, but he uses super armor to protect himself. It is high-level magic that can block most magic attacks. If it's just general armor, it may not be able to stop this black magic. Although Peter is not a person who will be punished, it is impossible to let them go so easily. I don't know if Dumbledore will put down the two people hanging in the corridor. Thinking of Peter slowly fell into a deep sleep. The next morning, when Peter came to the common room after washing up, he saw a lively scene. Alan White saw Peter coming out, ran up to him, and said gossip, Peter, let me tell you, those fifth grade Derek and Thomas, who had a conflict with each other, ended up hanging in the hallway. At night, it was discovered by Filch. Alan said with a wicked smile, I heard that I was hanged upside down all night, and my face turned blue when I put it down. I was so dizzy that I couldn't speak, and I was sent directly to the infirmary. Derek's group is actually not very popular in Slytherin, and the people of Slytherin judge the situation. When Voldemort was in power, most people followed him for profit. When Voldemort collapsed, he wiped himself clean in an instant. Or use money to get through the Ministry of Magic, or argue that you are under the imperious curse. It can be said that most people in Slytherin are always loyal to themselves. Even someone like Lucius Malfoy, who was considered a high-level Death Eater, saw Voldemort disappear, and immediately distanced himself from it. After using a large sum of money to buy off the top management of the Ministry of Magic, he argued that he was controlled by the Imperious Curse before joining the Death Eaters. There is nothing to do, continue to live your rich life. And some of them who were loyal to Voldemort were imprisoned in Azkaban. People like the Lestranges still adored Voldemort after he disappeared. Derek's father is one of them. For most of the Slytherins who judge the situation and are loyal to themselves, this kind of crazy obsession with Voldemort is not advisable. Even if they were once prostrate at Voldemort's feet. Flatteringly called the master. Not to mention that Voldemort is gone now, and it is the world of Dumbledore and the savior Harry Potter. Therefore, Derek, who has been taught badly, is out of tune in Slytherin. Except for a few people with the same interests, there are almost no people who can talk. Peter squinted his glasses when he heard Alan's words, and then asked, didn't they say who tied them? Was it really blown by the cool breeze all night? Alan nodded and said gloatingly, Professor Snape followed them when they were sent to the infirmary. It's just that they were frozen speechless. And Professor Snape didn't ask who attacked them. I heard that they wanted to sue, but were taught a spell by Snape, and they muted their voices said to let them have a good rest, they don't have to go to class today. Quote. Alan White rolled his eyes and whispered, I suspect that Professor Snape already knew who it was. 
and the person who dealt with Derek must be someone from our college. So Professor Snape won't let Derek say whoever hanged them. This is a serious matter, and if Derek speaks out, it will definitely make Slytherin lose a lot of points. Quote, Chin Yu was not too surprised, he was just a little surprised that Dumbledore didn't put Derek and the others down after he left. Now that he was noticed by Dumbledore, he didn't have much heartbreak. He didn't do anything wrong, so he wouldn't be guilty. It's just that the morning class was Professor Snape's potions, and Peter was still ready to be questioned by Snape. The potions classroom was still gloomy and dark. Snape's empty eyes glanced at the students present and found that no one was absent, and said, your task today is to make a sobriety potion. This is a very ineffective potion that can wake up your brain stuffed with splendens from anesthesia or lethargy. I used this potion this morning to wake up two idiots who were hanged all night. Snape said, turning his eyes to Peter. Peter looked up, just to meet Professor Snape's blank and indifferent eyes, he was very uncomfortable with these eyes, smiled politely at the professor, and looked away. Snape's eyes paused, then he turned to everyone thoughtfully, and said with a sneer, the preparation of the sobriety potion is very simple, even if you invite a troll, you can make it. I don't want you to be inferior to the troll. Quote. He said with a tone of schadenfreude, when you make the potion later, I will let you taste the potion you made. If you turn the potion into poison, be ready for the next time. Lying in the school infirmary. After more than a month of study, the freshmen had already experienced the horror of Professor Snape. As soon as they heard his words, some people with a bad mentality or bad talent for potions cried and set up the cauldron nervously, fearing that the potion they made would turn into poison. Even students with a good level of potion are anxiously looking at the potion steps on the blackboard, afraid of making mistakes. In this class, Peter and Alan White partnered. After setting up the crucible, Peter arranged, Alan, you are responsible for grinding the six snake teeth into powder. Be careful not to leave large particles. Alan White nodded, listen to you, your potion grades are good anyway. Peter was staring at the cauldron. He added six billywig worm needles to the cauldron and heated it on medium heat for 30 seconds. After calculating the time, when the liquid in the crucible starts to tumble, immediately remove the alcohol lamp. Alan White said, Peter, I've ground the snake teeth. Seeing that the snake teeth were very finely ground, Peter nodded and said, pour in the snake teeth powder. After the snake tooth powder entered the crucible, Peter stirred clockwise three times and waved his wand. The potion gradually turned lavender, exuding a fragrance similar to mint. Then it continued to heat for half an hour. Both Peter and Alan stared at the cauldron until the lilac potion heated and turned a deep purple. Alan White hurriedly handed Peter the two little blackheads he had prepared. Peter put the little aconite into the crucible and stirred it three times counterclockwise. Then waved the wand. At this time, the potion was no longer dark purple, but became as colorless as clear water. It was just the steam that came out, with a minty fragrance, which made Peter and Alan recently feel their heads wake up all of a sudden. Alan looked at the liquid in the crucible and asked uncertainly, has our potion been made? Peter nodded and affirmed, yes, as described in the textbook, the liquid is like water, with a minty fragrance, and you feel awake when you smell it. We succeeded. The two breathed a sigh of relief and removed the heated alcohol lamp under the crucible, then Peter raised his hand to signal to Professor Snape. Snape saw Peter raise his hand, silently approaching them like a bat. After carefully looking at the liquid in the crucible, I fanned the smell with my hand and smelled it with my nose. Then he announced expressionlessly, York and White are the first to complete the potion. Plus two points. Then, with a wave of his wand, the two droppers were transformed by him. Handed it to the two of them, I said, you need to taste the potion you make first. Let's see how the potion you make works. It only takes one drop. The others turned their attention to the two Peters, especially the twins watching the show from afar. Alan faced Snape's gaze, dripped the potion into his mouth nervously, and swallowed it. Peter has no pressure, he is very confident in the potion he made. So I immediately used a dropper and put a drop of the potion into my mouth. Both of them suddenly felt very awake, and the trace of sleepiness that was left behind disappeared. Looking at the sober eyes of the two, Snape said with a disappointed expression, the medicine works well, Slytherin adds two points. It's their standard potion for Mr. York. After that, 
Snape ignored the two of them, and continued to patrol the others, spraying venom when he caught students who were not doing well. After making the potion, the two instantly relaxed. They poured the potion in the cauldron into a special crystal bottle and put it on a shelf aside. Then he picked up the potion's textbook and read it silently. Near the end of get out of class, everyone's potions are finished. It's just that everyone didn't breathe a sigh of relief, but as if facing the enemy, waiting for fate to come. Professor Snape looked at everyone with a sneer, and then checked the potions made by the students one by one. Hey, Mr. Morden, tell me, why are there so many residues in your potion? Are your ears long for decoration? I already said that you pay attention to details, you are a snake's teeth without grinding them, right? Snape sneered as he approached a Gryffindor student and checked his potion. Then he made a dropper directly and said with malicious anticipation, Come on, Mr. Morden, please try your own potion, pay attention to only one drop, if there is more, I'm afraid I won't be able to save you in time. Morden of Gryffindor, with a sad face, picked up the dropper tremblingly, sucked a drop of the potion from the cauldron, and then dripped the potion into his mouth like death. However, although his potion looked terrible, it was still a sobriety potion after all, so Morden had no other reaction except that his mind became sober. Snape waited for a while, but didn't see any other reaction from him, and suddenly showed a look of disappointment, looks like Mr. Morden is very lucky. Seeing Snape leaving and escaping, Morden slumped on the chair with a lingering fear. He felt that he was favored by Merlin today, so he was not poisoned to death. Seeing that Morden was all right, the rest of the Gryffindor who were worried about him breathed a sigh of relief, and the twins couldn't help cheering. As a result, Snape's eyes were drawn tragically. Snape went directly to the twins, looked at them and sneered, it seems that Mr. Weasley is very confident in his potion. Let me appreciate your masterpiece. As soon as the twins saw Snape, they froze and quickly showed the professor the potion they had prepared. Although the twins' potion talent was not very good, the potions they made were quite satisfactory, but it was obvious that Snape didn't want to let them go so easily. With a sneer, he said, I thought Mr. Weasley, you guys, made some top-notch potions, so you are so happy. I didn't expect it to be this level. Didn't you play well with Mr. York, maybe you can ask him for advice come on, how to make potions. Instead of dancing around here like baboons. Peter's face was full of helplessness. If you want to scold them, just scold them. Why did you get involved with yourself? Does this mean that you can't see yourself playing well with Gryffindor people? The twins were shrunken together by Snape's venom, and they dared not refute. Although they liked to play, they often spoke ill of Snape's old bat behind their backs, but they were still a little embarrassed about him. After spraying the twins, Snape put away his fangs in satisfaction and continued to inspect, especially the potions of Gryffindor students. This time, he came to Lee Jordan and another Gryffindor student, looked blankly at the mucus in their cauldron, and asked gloomily, please tell me what this mass is. Well, sobriety medicine, Lee Jordan said uncertainly. Ha, huh, do you think this sticky thing is a sobriety potion? Snape sneered, and pretended to be surprised and announced to the crowd, I didn't expect a potions master among our first year freshmen to actually invent it. A brand new sobriety potion. Really worth encouraging. Lee Jordan and his classmates were embarrassed by Snape's taunting words. Especially Lee Jordan, his dark complexion was flushed, and he was ashamed and angry. Some of the Slytherin's pupils followed suit, drawing the twins and the rest of the Gryffindor to glare at them. Snape didn't care about the others, but conjured up two droppers, and said with a confused expression, Mr. Morden's potion was lucky to succeed just now, now let's see how your potions work. Give it a try, try it. Taking the dropper, the two of them looked at the potion with a cloud of mucus in the crucible, and wanted to refuse to try it. But looking at Snape's forced look, I'm afraid that if they don't come by themselves, Snape will help them. They had to resign and put a drop of potion into their mouths with a dropper. At first, there was no difference between the two of them, and the people of Gryffindor were relieved, thinking they had escaped. Snape's look of anticipation turned to disappointment. Suddenly, Lee Jordan and his classmates, foaming at the mouth, fell to the ground with pale faces, and their bodies twitched from time to time. Ah, Professor, they're poisoned. Everyone panicked, and the timid students of Gryffindor were scared to tears. Even the students in Slytherin who were mocking just now were a little overwhelmed. Idiot, 
Snape shouted angrily, and then prepared to take out a bazaar, divide it into two and stuff it into their mouths to relieve the toxicity. Then he turned around and roared, give me quiet. With a wave of the wand, two poisoned people floated up. Snape turned around and said sternly to everyone, I want to send these two to the school infirmary, lest they be poisoned by the poison I made. And you stay here for me, don't move. Peter York, you take care of the order in the classroom for me, and I have something to talk to you later. Got it, Snape said, looking at Peter. Peter nodded and said, good professor. I'll be waiting for you in the classroom. Snape nodded in satisfaction, then left the classroom with the two floating figures. Alan White said to Peter with a lingering fear, although Professor Snape is our dean, sometimes, I think he is quite scary. Then he asked curiously, the professor asked you to wait for him in the classroom. Does he have anything to ask you? Peter shook his head, I don't know, maybe just a normal conversation. When Professor Snape left, the potions classroom became lively, and everyone discussed what had just happened. Angelina Johnson of Gryffindor said to the classmates beside her with a worried look, you said that the two of them will be fine, don't you know how they turned the sobriety potion into poison? It's so scary. Did you see it? Lee Jordan's dark face suddenly turned pale, I thought he was dead. Anna Rodman, who was questioned, was still in shock at this time, patted her chest and said, seriously, although it's not good to say this, I'm very grateful for the two of them, otherwise it will be our turn to taste what's in the cauldron. The potion is out. The two looked into their own cauldron, and there was a gooey green mass that didn't fit the description of the sobriety potion in the textbook at all. I don't know if they take it, will it be as serious as Lee Jordan? The two looked at the potion in embarrassment, and invariably thanked Lee Jordan in their hearts that they had prevented the disaster for themselves. Professor Snape's departure revived the Weasley twins. The two of them embracing exaggerated tears and said passionately, Merlin's stinky socks. Our brother was almost murdered by Professor Snape. Look at his sinister smile. I wish our potion would turn into poison and poison us to death. Immediately triumphantly, fortunately, our potion is not bad, and we didn't let his conspiracy succeed. It's a fluke. Alan White looked at the noisy scene in the classroom, lowered his head and asked Peter, don't you mind them? Didn't Professor Snape put you in charge of this place? Peter shook his head and said indifferently, as long as they don't cause any trouble, I don't bother to manage, especially those Gryffindor people, do you think they will listen to me as a Slytherin? But looking at the twins who danced the most, Peter rolled his eyes, grinned wickedly, and put his wand on his neck. Oh, I didn't expect Mr. Weasley to have such an opinion on me. It seems that I need to make it a little more difficult for you, two Mr. Weasleys who claim to be excellent in potions. Snape's indifferent voice rang in the classroom, and cooperated within the dim environment, it looks very gloomy. The voices in the classroom stopped abruptly, and everyone sat up straight and closed their mouths in horror, not daring to move. The originally cheerful twins were frightened by the sound and almost fell over. They hurriedly sat down and shouted tremblingly, S. Professor Snape. It's Professor Snape. It's not Professor Snape. Ten points from Gryffindor. Since you named the professor indiscriminately. Snape's gloomy voice came again. When the twins heard that they were about to deduct points, they were immediately discouraged, crying and dreading, not daring to refute. They had already been deducted a lot of points for their participation in the Quidditch tryouts. Now that they have been deducted again, if Percy knew about it, he would have to report to his mother. It's time for a shouting letter. After waiting for a while, they didn't hear Snape's voice either, so they looked back boldly and didn't see Professor Snape. He glanced around, but still no figure was found. What are you guys looking at? Snape's cold voice sounded again, causing the two of them to wince. It's just that they looked in the direction where the sound came from, and found that Peter was casting a spell with his wand down with his neck down with a smirk, while Alan White next to him was covering his stomach and laughing. What are you looking at? All your credits will be deducted if you watch. Snape's voice came out of Peter's mouth strangely. The Weasley twins understood now, they were tricked by Peter. Immediately, he rushed over in anger, Ah, Peter, you bastard. You pretend to be Snape's voice to frighten us, too bad. Peter was attacked from both sides by the two, and the twins tickled him in tacit agreement, trying to release their anger on him. Peter was scratched by the two of them until he laughed and kept begging for mercy. Okay, George, Fred, I was wrong. 
Ha ha, stop scratching, I'm ticklish. After playing for a long time, the two let Peter go. Peter wiped the tears from his laughter, and then saw that there were glaring eyes around him, and he couldn't help but smile. Alan White, who was watching the whole process, said gloatingly, you're provoking public anger. It's not like you don't know how scary Professor Snape is, but you scared them so much that you almost scare their hearts out. Regardless of what other people think, the twins pester Peter and ask, what kind of magic did you use just now, Peter? It sounds exactly like Snape's. This is so cool, teach us. Peter smiled and said, this is a spell I learned from Professor Flitwick. It is a variant of the loud voice spell, and it is my first time to cast it. It can imitate the voices of many people and animals. I can teach you any time you want. You guys, but you should go back to your seats first and watch out for Professor Snape's return. The Weasley Twins Oh, sly Peter, don't try to lie to us this time, we wouldn't believe it if you said Snape was standing behind us now. You two Weasleys, what are you doing? Professor Snape's voice sounded. When the twins heard this voice, they were not as frightened as before, but said triumphantly, Peter, you can't scare us, hurry up and give us the spell. Otherwise, we will have to use the tickling skill again. After waiting for a while, the twins realized that the classroom was a little too quiet at this time, and then looked at Alan next to Peter, who was sitting upright on the chair at this time, staring down at the potions book on the table, it's like looking out a hole in a book. And Peter, looking awkwardly behind them, Professor, I'm just about to tell them to sit back. The twins watched as Peter spoke behind them. He laughed in surprise, ha ha. Peter, you're not kidding anymore, I, we won't believe your words anymore. Mr. Weasley, what are you doing? A deep voice came from behind, with a bit of anger. The twins were totally stupid because they saw that Peter didn't open his mouth. He turned around tremblingly, and saw Professor Snape, who had been gloomy for a year, standing behind them. S. Professor Snape. The twins shouted nervously, with barely a smile on their faces, with pleading in their eyes, hoping Snape would let them go this time. But obviously their wish could not be realized. Snape always had the principle of killing the wrong and not letting go of the students of Gryffindor. This time, he happened to catch these two Weasleys who are the most hilarious dancers. There is no reason to let them go. Professor Snape's indifferent face showed a smile of finally catching you, which made the twins tremble, running around the classroom without authorization during class, the two Mr. Weasleys will deduct 10 points, 10 points each. The twins were about to cry when they heard it, and pleadingly said, Professor, please. If we deduct any more points, we'll have to send a shouting letter from Mom. And Gryffindor has no points to deduct now. Hearing this, Snape didn't show any sympathy. Instead, he showed a successful smile and said sinisterly, then deduct another 10 points. If you defy the teacher for the two, you can go back to your seat now. The twins couldn't be bothered to pray any longer. If they were afraid to stay any longer, Snape would have to deduct their points for various reasons. Quickly ran back to the seat, where the eggplant looked like. Peter watched Professor Snape's operations in a stunned manner, and almost dropped his jaw. Perhaps because Harry Potter had not come yet, Snape was not as tit-for-tat to other academies, especially Gryffindor students, in addition to being a little indifferent at this time. At this time, Peter thought that the original author's description of Snape was just an exaggeration to create a sense of conflict. But I didn't expect to see such a scene today. At this time, Professor Snape, in the dim classroom, is exactly like the most evil dark wizard in the story. Greasy hair, indifferent and empty eyes, a thin body, and a hooked nose. Can't blame Harry Potter for making him the bad guy early on and ignoring the stammering Professor Quirrell. Anyone would consider him a dark wizard. After dealing with the twins, Snape turned to look at Peter, who was watching the play, and a low voice came out of his mouth, Mr. York, I asked you to manage the order of the classroom, that's how you manage it. I'm so disappointed, come to my office for confinement tonight. Peter opened his palm innocently, Professor, I'm just a freshman in the first year, and I can't even perform any decent magic. How do you want me to manage these people? Snape took a deep look at him and sneered, Okay, Mr. York who doesn't know magic, use your wand to handle potion materials at night. I think it's enough for you to perform decent magic. Quote. When Peter heard this, he sat down with a helpless expression on his face. Who is Snape going to trouble with, and for many reasons? 
At this time, the class had not ended, and all the students in the classroom sat obediently in their seats, burying their heads on the table, afraid of being noticed by Snape. Professor Snape looked at everyone and sneered. You may imagine that I can stay in the school infirmary for those two monsters who drank homemade poison, that would be naive. Madame Pomfrey's medical skills are good. A dose of antidote will make those two idiots jumping around. After speaking, under the terrified eyes of everyone, dozens of droppers were created out of thin air. With a wave of the wand, the droppers flew to all the students who had not yet been tested. Let's continue the test now. Let's see if there are trolls who don't understand potions and make potions comparable to poison. Snape gave a grim smile, come on. Take a drop of potion and put it in your mouth, don't worry, Madame Pomfrey has enough beds ready. Looking at Snape who was threatening everyone with the potion, Peter almost didn't take out his wand and give it to Snape. This is so scary, he wondered if Snape had been replaced during the time he was out. Some of the more courageous boys resigned and dropped the potion into their mouths with a generous expression of sacrifice. Some girls were frightened by Snape's expression, sobbing and holding the dropper, not daring to put their mouths down. Mr. Pardon, what are you dragging? Do you need me to help you? Snape sneered as he approached a Gryffindor boy. The boy named Patton shook his head into a rattle, quickly put the potion in the dropper into his mouth, and swallowed it. He was afraid that if he didn't do it again, Snape would hold him down and pour the potion. As soon as the others saw this situation, they immediately drank the potion in their hands, fearing that Snape would catch him one step later. Although the potions made by many people are all kinds of strange, they do not cause any symptoms and they are all normal. But suddenly there was a scream. A Slytherin girl watched in horror, and the two Slytherin boys in front of him kept spitting blood. Blood was pouring out of mouth, nose, ears, eyes. Immediately, the two people were dyed into blood. This scene is so scary, many people are scared to scream and cry. Screaming to go home. Quiet, Snape cursed in a loud voice, suppressing the crying in the classroom. Then he ran to the two Slytherins who were spewing blood, checked them carefully, and then looked relieved. Standing up straight, he sneered, Mr. Monty, and Mr. Burst, congratulations on your invention of a new potion. You actually turned a sober potion into a blood-boosting potion. Do I want to congratulate you all? About to become a potion master. The big fat man Graham, who was covered in blood and was still bleeding from his mouth, shouted in horror, Professor, please help me. I don't want to die yet. Woohoo, Bian there is blood in the mouth. Another burst also screamed in fright. Snape looked at the blood stained too and roared, Idiot, this is just the effect of your super blood tonic. No one can die, can you let me go? The two crying bloody men, frightened by Snape's aura, quickly shut up and withdrew their bloody hands lying on Snape's robes, completely helpless. Looking at the two of them, Snape looked helpless and could only shout, Peter York, hurry up and send these two idiots to the school infirmary. Then come to my office after class. Peter looked at the two bleeding students, nodded quickly, okay, professor, then waved his wand and directly floated the two students up, ignoring their panicked claws and claws in midair, and rushed directly to the school infirmary. Only Professor Snape was left to watch deeply, and the first-year student who unconsciously cast spells silently disappeared outside the classroom door. There are only nine freshmen in this class of Slytherin, in addition to Peter and his roommate Alan White, there are only Burn Burst, Graham Monta, Edward Yaxley, a total of five boys. Among them, the name of Montage Graham, Peter knew a little bit. This big fat man is the future Slytherin chaser, and when Harry Potter formed the DA club in fifth grade, as Umbridge's helper and member of the investigation team, when he wanted to deduct points for Gryffindor, he was stabbed in the head by Fred. A cannon fodder in the vanishing cabinet. Monta, who was enchanted and floated in the air, shouted to Peter in a panic, Peter, put us down, we can go by ourselves. Burst nodded nervously and wanted to get down. Peter looked at them covered in blood shook his head and refused. No, you will dirty the corridor, if you are caught by filch, you will suffer. And you are patients now, I want to ensure your safety. There were also some senior students in the corridor who had no class in the morning. They looked at Peter in surprise, and the two blood-soaked people floating behind them rushed to the school infirmary, thinking that something had happened, so they quickly got out of the way. Quickly coming to the school infirmary, Peter hurriedly knocked on the door of the school infirmary, Mrs. Pomfrey, come and see my classmates. 
Hearing a student knocking on the door, Pomfrey came out, what happened? Then he looked up and saw the two bloody men floating, and was shocked, oh, Merlin. What's going on? Come on in. Peter hurriedly instructed the two of them to float into the infirmary, put them on the hospital bed, and explained, Mrs. Pomfrey, we were in a potions class just now, and Professor Snape asked us to drink the potion we made, and they ended up like this. It's gone. Madame Pomfrey threw out several spells in a row, and carefully examined the two people who were covered in blood on the bed, and then her nervous expression relaxed, and she said, they're fine. It's just like they ate a lot of blood supplements and overdosed it. Now, I'll give them some medicine later and they'll be fine. Immediately complaining. Snape is also really, such a dangerous thing can be done, but let you drink the potion you made yourself. I'm not afraid that students will be poisoned by those messy potions. It has already been delivered just now. Two poisoned students, now two more. I have to talk to Dumbledore. Hearing the two people who had just been sent by Professor Snape, Peter asked, Mrs. Pomfrey, are those two okay? Madame Pomfrey waved her hand, don't worry, although you Professor Snape always does some dangerous things, he is a master of potions. There is no potion in the world that can beat him. After using the bazaar to get rid of the poison on their bodies, I just need to drink a little more potion, and I will be completely healed after a good rest for a day. You are freshmen, right? What kind of potion did Snape ask you to make? Why are so many students poisoned by potions? Peter looked helpless and said, it's a sobriety potion. Madame Pomfrey thought it was some kind of difficult potion to make, but when she heard it was the simplest sobriety potion, she silently looked at the student who had been poisoned by the potion she had made on the bed, then they have a talent for potions. Too bad, this is a compulsory course, and they have to endure it for at least five years. When they heard the news, Monty and Burst, who were lying on the hospital bed, became even more desperate. If the potions classes in the future often do this, they don't know if they will be able to live to graduate. Leaving the two patients in the infirmary, Peter said goodbye to Madame Pomfrey and rushed to the potions office. Now that the get out of class is over, many students are rushing out of the classroom, chasing and fighting each other. Coming to the office door, Peter knocked, heard, come in. And walked in. Professor, are you looking for me? Peter asked, pretending to be puzzled. In fact, he had already guessed in his heart that it was probably the two Derek, who had failed the sneak attack last night and had been hanged by him all night, and complained to Snape. Snape was sitting on his desk, grading a bunch of homework, and when he heard Peter's words, he sneered, looked at Peter deeply, and said, Derek and Thomas, both hanging in the hallway all night, this morning. I was found and sent to the infirmary. After they woke up, they told me that you attacked them. I don't know how you explain it. Peter looked away from Snape. He knew that this was not only a potions master, but also an occlumency master who could fool Voldemort, as well as a superb dementor. If you are watched by his eyes for a long time, it is very likely that the secrets in your head will be quietly acquired. Peter said with a joking look on your face, Professor, I'm only a first-year freshman, and I've just come to Hogwarts from Muggle society. And Derek and the others are already fifth-year students, and there are two of them. You think I have as such an ability sneak attacking them. If you don't believe me, you can also ask Mrs. Pins from the library. She looked at me last night and came out of the library just before the curfew. Where did you get the time to attack them? This is ridiculous. Seeing Peter's wronged expression, Snape's mouth twitched. If he hadn't heard the news from Dumbledore early in the morning, he probably would have believed him. As expected of being the only Muggle student who has been classified into Slytherin in the past 100 years, with such a lie that he does not change his face, I am afraid that only Slytherin is the most suitable for him. Otherwise, those impulsive Gryffindors or honest Hufflepuffs will all be fooled by this cunning little snake. Peter looked at Snape as you continued, and knew it must be the old bee from Dumbledore, telling him what happened last night. But he continued to pretend to be wronged and said, Professor, I swear I didn't attack them. You can't just listen to them and believe it. Snape didn't say much about this, not to mention that two fifth-year students shamelessly attacked the first-year students, and they were also defeated by the first-year students. This was enough to lose Slytherin's face, so he directly cast a spell to shut them up when Derek and the others were awake and wanted to complain. He came to Peter this time, mainly because of Dumbledore's request to let him pay more attention to this gifted student and avoid him going astray. 
and he was also very curious about the muggle student who was like a duck to water in Slytherin. At first he entered Slytherin as a half-blood, but it took several years of hard work to gain a firm foothold in the academy with this superb talent for potions. But Peter has performed perfectly since he was sorted into Slytherin. After he beat a group of students of the same grade to the bottom of the Slytherin chief challenge, he wisely stepped down and gave up the position of chief. Because he knew that even if he was elected chief by force, these students who respected blood would not listen to him, so he simply gave up the trouble from the beginning. Not only showed his strength and talent, people dare not underestimate. Do not intensify the contradictions between each other, so that you will not be isolated in Slytherin. It can be said to be quite perfect. Surprised Snape, who had been following him. Snape stared at the little boy in front of him and reminded, It doesn't matter if I believe it or not, it's just that Derek and Thomas, as heirs of the pure blood family, have received attention from the family, as long as they tell the family about this, they won't. Don't let it go. Especially the Derek family, they were once loyal followers of the you know who, and disliked muggles very much. You have to be careful. Hearing Snape's words, Peter understood what he said, and asked in disbelief, did they dare to run into the school to deal with me? And a fifth grader was beaten by the first grade, shouldn't they be? Do you want to educate their children? How can you blame others? Snape seemed to have thought of something, his expression became gloomy, then his eyes became empty, his expression was a little indifferent, and he said with a sarcastic tone, in the eyes of these people, only pure blood is noble, if it is mixed blood or muggle-born it's a disgrace that the wizards of the world have been defeated. So they will try their best to erase this disgrace. Peter was not frightened by Snape's words, not to mention that he is now in the blood of the phoenix and is not afraid of death. Even his phoenix field is a powerful magical animal that can fight dragons. And he can also take him to teleport away directly, ignoring the ban. And he has never formally fought against anyone. Peter looked at Professor Snape gratefully, thank you for your reminder, Professor, otherwise I wouldn't know about these things. Immediately, a cold glint flashed in his eyes, and he said in a cold tone, but they want to get rid of my words, I'm afraid it's not enough. Seeing Peter's serious expression, Snape's eyes flashed with a smile, and then he said, but don't worry, Dumbledore, considering the complexity of this matter, decided to let them forget what happened last night, so they will only remember I was hanged myself, and I don't know who hung them up. So now it can only be regarded as a headless koan. Headmaster Dumbledore, Peter looked at Snape in surprise, he didn't expect Dumbledore to be involved in this matter, and also modified Derek's memory, Headmaster, why is he helping me? We don't seem to know each other. Quote. Snape shook his head, I don't know why he wants to help you, but it's clear that Dumbledore is very optimistic about you. For this reason, he needs to block the anger of the two pureblood families and let this hidden danger end without a trace. But he still reminded again, but there is no guarantee that you will be safe in the future. There are some people in the academy who are very paranoid about blood. They haven't shown their heads yet, just because they are pressed by Dumbledore, and most of them Slytherin chose to accept you. But you need to be careful, you better not run around like those stupid lions, I don't want to receive your wreck one day. Peter now felt that Snape was not as inaccessible as it seemed. What he said to himself, although always with a gun and a stick. But with the thinking of an adult, putting aside those external thorns, he can analyze that this is caring for himself. Although the reason may simply be that Peter is a student of his college. Peter pretended to be obedient and thanked Snape. Thank you, Professor Snape, for your concern for me. I will obey your words and save my life. Hearing Peter's words, Snape's face darkened, and this little brat became more and more daring to mock him in person. It's as if he didn't see the kid's deliberate smile. Snape growled angrily. You still think about how you will be in Slytherin, and make it through these seven years. I remember the last time a muggle-born student who was sorted into Slytherin by the sorting hat died inexplicably at the school. Lee, at that time, not even a murderer was caught. Although the environment is better now, it is impossible for you to spend seven years in Slytherin smoothly. There will be many children from pure blood families coming to Hogwarts next year, and even children of school directors. These people's thinking may be more radical, you don't want them to catch the handle and be expelled from school. Quote, Peter didn't understand this somewhat deformed magical society, and he directly complained, it's almost the 21st century, 
The muggle world is changing with each passing day, but the magical world is still like the Middle Ages. What kind of bloodlines? If this continues, I am afraid that it will not be long before the secrets of the magic world will be discovered by muggles. At that time, I am afraid that there will be a battle. If these people don't change their minds, they will be just a bunch of research materials on the experimental bench. Quote, as soon as the words fell, Peter keenly noticed that there was a magical fluctuation next to the fireplace. He looked over there and found nothing. But Peter knew the disillusionment charm himself, so he guessed there was someone invisible all the time. As soon as he thought about it, he guessed who it was. However, as if he didn't notice it, he turned his eyes to Snape, only to find that Snape was looking at him strangely at this time. Snape didn't expect an 11-year-old child to be able to say this, and whether it's true or not, but it's surprising enough. Suddenly Snape froze, as if he had received some news, then looked at Peter strangely, and asked, how did you come to such a conclusion? What do you mean, if the wizarding world were to fight against muggles, wizards lose? Peter noticed the situation and guessed that the invisible man had asked Snape to ask such a question, but he didn't care. He glanced around and found that there was no place for him to sit, so he took out a wrapping paper of ZZ honey candy and pointed it with his wand, the wrapping paper turned into a comfortable chair. Both Snape and the invisible people were very surprised. They didn't expect Peter's transfiguration talent to be so good. This is not the level that a first-year student should have. Peter sat down, and then said to Snape, Professor, there are pure blood in the wizarding world, and in the muggle world it is no less. It also has some blood ties with the current royal family. Although we have no real power, we can enter the muggle high level and have a lot of information. He looked at Snape's surprised expression, and continued, Professor, have you ever counted the number of muggles? There are 5.3 billion people in the world. And I have checked the British wizarding world, at most tens of thousands. The total number of wizards in the rest of the world is less than a million at most. Magic is amazing, but it's not everything. He can't control everyone, and when the mysterious veil of the magical world is lifted one day, then muggles will no longer be in awe of magic. They will try to find the source of this power, and the wizards are their research material. When the wizards break their wands and infiltrate the muggle society, they can only hide in darkness. Quote. Hearing this, Snape couldn't help but be surprised. Although he came from the muggle society, his childhood misfortune made him very repulsive to the muggle world, so he hadn't been in contact with the Muggle Society over the years and had nothing to do with the Muggle world. No. But as a wizard, he was still very proud, so he couldn't help refuting Peter's conclusion, Mr. York, there may be a lot of Muggles, but they don't know anything about magic, they can't use it, and they can't stop the attack of magic. We have many ways to control them. And now the Prime Minister of the Muggle world often talks to our Minister of Magic. They know the existence of our magic world, but after so many years, they are still in peace. You are too unreasonable, quote. When Peter heard Snape's words, he didn't immediately refute, but asked, Professor, I wonder if you know about World War II during Grindelwald. As soon as he finished speaking, Peter noticed the magic fluctuations coming from the fireplace again, and couldn't help but smile in his heart. When he mentioned this name, he had such a big reaction. Snape wondered how he had shifted the subject here, but not it anyway. As if telling a story, Peter explained, the whole world was in chaos. England was bombed by Germany. And not long after Grindelwald was captured, Germany was defeated and surrendered. At this time, far to the east the island country of the island country is still stubbornly resisting, so the United States directly dropped two mushroom bombs, directly killing tens of thousands of them in an instant. Hundreds of thousands of people died one after another. And this is only a weapon from the 1940s and 1950s. Today, muggle weapons far exceed the power of mushroom bombs. And there are so many. A scientist in our muggle community once said that if there is a third world war, after this war, human wars will become fights with stones and sticks. I don't know what the most powerful magic in the magical world is like. But from what I've been exposed to so far, the so-called most terrifying black magic is simply incomparable to the power of weapons in the muggle world. Quote. Although Snape was a little surprised by the power of these muggle weapons, he still said, you may not know that there is a black magic in the wizarding world, which can control people's minds and make them obey your orders. And this kind of magic is even the most powerful.
Even the mighty Oro can't resist, let alone a muggle. Peter said. Professor, you are talking about the imperious curse, but this black magic is forbidden by the Ministry of Magic, and anyone who dares to use it will be sent to Azkaban. The question is how many people can successfully use this kind of black magic? When will they be able to control billions of people around the world? Snape didn't expect Peter to know about this dark magic, but when he thought about how often he was in the library, he knew it and guessed which book he must have read about it. He replied directly, As long as you control the muggle high level, it won't take much effort. For this, Peter agreed, but still said, this method may be effective in the short term, but it will definitely be exposed in the long run. Human beings are very strange intelligent creatures. When there are no foreign enemies, they will often kill you and me. But when it comes to survival, they'll stick together, and if they can't beat them, they'll rather drag you to hell. I find it weird when I read the history books of the wizarding world. Wizards make fun of medieval muggle witch hunts, and they also describe weird witches who like to be burned, so they are deliberately caught by muggles. But the question is, if wizards really look down on muggles so much, why would they rather give up large fertile territories and hide the magic world instead? Is it true that, as the book says, wizards disdain to associate with muggles, that's why they shut yourself up? Peter said sarcastically. He looked at Snape. Professor do you really believe that? Snape was stunned at the moment, he hadn't thought about it. In other words, almost all wizards ignore the contradictions described in the book, consciously or unconsciously. When people see weird witches playing muggles in books, they will only laugh at the stupidity of muggles, and they will not consider why the ancestors would prefer to use magic to hide the wizarding world in the corners and alleys, like mice in the dark, and also don't want to go out and magically rule what they see as stupid and vulnerable muggles. Peter was born in the muggle world. He was an ordinary person in his last life. He has seen Xinjiangxiang, whose technology is changing with each passing day. The constantly updated smartphone will reappear in this world in more than 10 years. The satellites in the sky, the cameras everywhere, the network extending in all directions, and the rapidly developing technology and information technology make this world no longer secret. Magic may be able to fool the human senses, but definitely not machines. When the magic world is exposed, the situation will be very delicate. Peter watched Professor Snape pondered, smiled and comforted, Professor, you don't have to worry too much, there are still decades in the magic world, maybe there will be someone who can turn the tide by then. Snape looked at him in surprise and said, I thought you'd say you'd solve this problem yourself. Haven't you analyzed the wizarding world so thoroughly, why didn't you go further? The person hiding on the side also looked at Peter, wanting to hear his explanation. Peter waved his hand funny, I don't want to carry such a heavy burden. I came to the magic world just to learn magic and feel the charm of magic. But it doesn't mean that I will stay in the magic world in the future. Although the magic world is magical, it is too too outdated and out of tune with me. Besides, my opinion just now can be easily given by anyone who is familiar with the history of Muggle World Wars and has a certain understanding of Muggle technology. This is not an esoteric question. Okay, let's end such a heavy topic. Peter stood up and bowed slightly to Snape, Professor, thank you again for reminding me, I will be careful not to let those people take the chance. Out of the corner of his eye, he glanced in the direction of the fireplace. Professor, please thank Principal Dumbledore for me by the way. If it weren't for him, I might be in trouble right now. Snape was a little distracted by Peter's words and nodded to let Peter leave. When Peter closed the office door and left, the potion's office fell into silence, except for the crackling sound of the wood burning in the fireplace. Then Dumbledore, wearing a dark purple robe covered with silver stars, appeared. He wears half-moon glasses, and his long silver hair falls behind him. He came to the silent Snape and took out ye candy, Severus, would you like to try Honeyduke's latest cockroach pile? No, I won't eat this. Snape pushed away the box of sweets full of cockroaches with a defiant expression. Then he looked up and looked directly at Dumbledore. Is what Peter York said true? Is the wizarding world hiding itself from muggles? Dumbledore took back the cockroach pile with a sad face, picked up a lively cockroach sweet, and put it in his mouth. In Snape's eyes full of disgust, he chewed with satisfaction. Then he said slowly, Mr. York, what you said may be a little exaggerated, but it is basically the same as the truth. Snape couldn't believe it, 
he didn't expect it to be true. He asked with a dry throat, why hasn't anyone said it for so many years, doesn't the Ministry of Magic see this happening? Dumbledore stopped the pile of cockroaches in his hand, sighed inexplicably, and said, in fact, someone predicted this kind of future a long time ago, so that person actively wanted to change this situation, even I once attracted by his ambitions. But because of his two radical theories, I parted ways with him and ended up in an antagonistic situation. And since the fall of the man, the magical world has avoided this theory, especially the Ministry of Magic strictly prohibits the spread of this muggle threat theory. They are afraid that this theory will lead to conflicts and contradictions, leading to peace for a long time. The wizarding world is once again plunged into the chaos of war. Dumbledore sat in the chair that Peter had transformed, and let out a comfortable sigh, Mr. York, it always surprises me. I didn't expect his transfiguration talent to be so good. I think Professor McGonagall will be very happy. When you get old, your body is very fragile. After standing for so long, my old bones almost fell apart. Snape had some guesses about the person in his mouth, and couldn't help but ask, you mean Grindelwald, the dark wizard, right? When Grindelwald ravaged Europe and the United States, due to the existence of Dumbledore and the complicated relationship between the two, Grindelwald's power did not touch England. So British wizards, although they know the name known as the first generation of the Dark Lord, know very little about him. Hearing the name Snape said, Dumbledore's eyes, which were covered by his glasses, waved slightly. He nodded, yeah, you weren't born in that era, so you don't know how attractive Grindelwald's theories are, almost wizards all over the world aspire to that kind of life. And he's very charming, many people throw in his ranks and form the Umrah party. It's just that his theory is too radical. He wants to enslave muggles by means of war and make wizards masters. This makes some people unacceptable, and the Ministry of Magic cannot accept such above the Ministry of Magic. Humans exist. So the wizarding world has had the biggest war ever in the wizarding world. Even the muggle world was brought into World War II. A lot of people died during it until I asked Grindelwald for a duel, and put him in Nurmengard to end the war. But some wizards are affected by this, and they start to pay attention to the disparity of power between wizards and muggles, and they are not willing to accept this fact. Dumbledore looked at Snape, so they are seeing another Dark Lord, proposed extinction. When the muggle proposed, they all joined him. I want to struggle one last time. Hearing this, Snape avoided Dumbledore's gaze with some embarrassment on his originally calm face, and spit out a few words with difficulty, mysterious man. Dumbledore nodded, but these people are disappointed, Voldemort is indeed powerful, but he always thinks about himself, not as ambitious as Grindelwald, nor does he care about the future of wizards. Voldemort only believes in himself. What he wants is not to enslave muggles like those pure blood families, but to enslave everyone, including his wizards. Hearing the word slavery, Snape unconsciously touched his arm, where there was a mark that could not be removed. There was a time when he was honored by the mark, but now it's a shackle that can never be taken off. Dumbledore noticed his condition, his voice slightly softer, Severus, it's never a shame to get lost. Even I was once drawn to Grindelwald's theory and nearly went astray, only to be lucky to stop halfway. Down. Whether a person is good or bad is never judged by where he came from, but by what path he chose and what he did. Dumbledore touched the upholstered chair under his buttocks and sighed, Peter this kid, he reminds me of Grindelwald, the same talent. Room for growth, if cultivated well, it will be the future of the magic world. So Severus, I need you to guide him well, you are his dean, and you are not afraid of you looking at him, we can't let this kid go astray, or it will be a disaster for the wizarding world. Thanks for watching, please like and subscribe.